Next up, uh, we have Austin Seip. Uh, he is pretty well known for his work on GHC, uh, but we're very happy today to have him presenting on something exciting and completely different from that. Uh, it's going to be about uh, some crypto stuff, right? Yes, software verification. All right. So. Well, take it away, Austin. Cool, thank you. Thank you, you're far too kind already. Um, okay, so I'm going to start off with a quick intro. Uh, so I've been a Haskell programmer since about 10 years ago. Uh, I've been a professional engineer for a little bit less than that. Um, in my past life, which is a little bit weird for someone like me maybe, is I used to do things like data backup, security research. Um, so, you know, I would break things and then find out why my software was broken, et cetera, et cetera. But for the past couple of years, um, a lot of people will know me from working on the Glasgow Haskell compiler. Um, I was the release manager for a couple releases, and I write Haskell all around the world for all kinds of fun clients. And I'm also an amateur cryptographer in my spare time. Um, so I, I, I want to go ahead and start off, and I just want to like set the stage for this talk. So I'm a developer, right? I'm not like a mathematician. I have like no fancy mathematical skills, um, but readable code is important to me. Development tools are important to me, and I want people to walk away from here. Not, I'm not going to get too deep into you know, fancy math or anything. There will be a little touching on stuff like that. Um, but I want you to walk away with a tool that you could actually maybe sit down and, you know, in an afternoon you can get some results from it, like real quick. So, you know, crypt cryptographic primitives are diverse in a lot of different ways. For one, we have a lot of different kind of primitives, right? So you have encryption, hash functions, key derivations, authentication. Uh, we have asymmetric cryptography. But then... The diversity doesn't stop there because we often compose them for lots of different purposes in a lot of different contexts. So some examples, we have IPsec, uh, TLS, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with, uh, full disk encryption, OTR. And I mean, like, if you really look into it, I mean, there's so much crypt cryptography in the modern software and hardware stack, it's unbelievable. Um, and, you know, all of these use an assortment of that, uh, of that technology. So IPsec, you know, it... Uh, uses uh, signing, authentication, encryption. OTR uses, I think, almost a full gamut. Um, it uses hashing, uh, hashing signatures, uh, you know, uh, authenticators, you know, all that stuff, uh, elliptic curves. FDE is interesting because it actually, it just uses encryption. There's, like, not really a good theory for authentication on disk, which is a little bit unfortunate. Um, but needless to say, they, it, it, they're, it's all over the place, right? And so... A lot of specifications for software are just really terrible. First off, a lot of them don't exist, but even when they do, it's not really great. But cryptographic ones are very frequent if you look, and they are doubly awful because you often get a specification that is written in text, and you may get code that's written by someone who spent six months optimizing it you know, in order to make it as fast as possible. So it's very, very difficult to exactly you know, like break the barrier. So here's an example of what you might see if you looked into you know, some kind of paper or whatever. So this is Galois counter mode uh, from NIST. Uh, it's very popular with AES. Uh, it is an authenticator that you use with encryption. And I mean, you know, it, this is you know, some nonsense about the way you know, uh, G hash or I think works or something like that. It, I mean, I could decipher this, but it's not really that useful as text, right? I mean, I could read it and then implement it, but it's just, it's a little bit difficult. And even then, if I wanted to implement it, most of the languages I'll implement this in are going to be far, far lower level, right? They're going to be a, you know, an order of magnitude, like, you know, less abstraction. So bridging the gap is difficult. Um, and, you know, that's really sad because programs are something, you know, we write, we run, we analyze. You know, they're constructive, and manipulating them is most likely the job of many of you in this room. So we can do a lot better than raw text. And that is where Cryptol comes in. So there's a purely functional programming language pretty much only for cryptographic specifications. You can use it to solve cute things like in queens and stuff like that, little you know, puzzle solvers, but it's primarily for this. Um, if you know Haskell, it will look very, very familiar. It is heavily based on it. The implementation is written in Haskell. Uh, it is written by Galois, which many Haskell programmers in the audience will know of. Um, it's got a very similar type system. Syntactically, it's very similar. It's purely functional. Um, but it's, a, it's different in some other ways. So it's got some nice additions. Uh, one of them is as type-level arithmetic. For anyone who's used GHC in the past couple years, we have something like this. It is nowhere near as elegant or powerful. And underneath, Cryptol, aside from type-checking, it uses, uh, 
you're, you're going to hear some talks later on SMT solvers. In particular, there are going to be two good talks using uh, Z3. Uh, Crypto uses CBC4. There's nothing really preventing it from using anything else, but it's just what they chose. Um, and then it has some verification technology based, it has a very novel equivalence checker, sort of based on some theory that is found sort of in circuit literature, which I found quite intriguing. And then it's got some other things, you know, it's got, mod, it's got different module and scoping rules, it's got quick check as a language feature, which you can use things to generate uh, test vectors for your algorithm, stuff like that. And it has some reductions too. So there are type classes, but you can't write them yourself. They're mostly just a convenience for certain parts of the API. There's no real built-in I.O. So if you want to render something, you render a string, right? Um, so, you, so if you want to output anything, you, know, you do it on your terminal, um, just you know, in the REPL or whatever. And there's no real user-defined data types or anything. And there's no pattern matching beyond the built-in sequence type, which is sort of the most important type, as we'll see pretty quickly. Um, so we should just go ahead and get started. So here we have an example of a Haskell function. It takes two 32-bit words, it returns a 32-bit word, and it adds them. Or it, it returns the addition of them, I'm sorry. And here's the cryptal translation. Right? It looks pretty similar. Um, it, they actually you know, erred on the side of you know, using the correct syntax for the colon. But um, so you know, it's weird. I think I actually like the, the double colon. I'm probably the only person on the planet. But you know, they inarguably got that right. Um, but you know, it has a slightly, it has an actual literal size of the integers that you're dealing with inside the, inside the type, right? So it looks, it looks similar, but it's different, right? And then that number can be arbitrary, right? So we can have very, you know, if you ever wanted 17-bit integers in your programming language, Cryptol is definitely your language. If you wanted so many bits, it might remind you of a phone number from a song from the 80s, you can also have that. Um, and I actually, I'm pretty sure that one runs too. Like it actually, it uses GMP underneath whenever it interprets all this stuff. So I mean, it's pretty quick. And uh, sequences are really, really fundamental. Um, so here's some more examples, right? So like in Haskell, we have like you know a uh, like in a num from two, right? Like a range, and that gives us you know a sequence of uh, zero to three. You can index a sequence, so you can say this is the zeroth, this is the first, this is the second, and at one you get one. Interestingly, you can also index from the back of a sequence, and I have never used this, so I don't actually know why they have it. Um, and then you can also concatenate sequences. Note this isn't cons, this is actually concatenation of sequences. Um, and then you, know, you, can, you can bury sequences like arbitrarily deep, right? So this is a sequence with two entries, each of which has three 16-bit integers in it, right? Um, and all these operations, I should note, occur modulo with the size of the number. So, you know, this is a 16-bit integer. It occur, it operates, you know, uh, arithmetic modulo 2 to the power of 16, as you would expect on normal hardware, right? And here's an interesting example, too, about the way sequences work. So, um, you know, aside from actually being in the brackets, which denote, like, sort of the width, they can, you can also have a type variable that's just independent, right? So here what I'm saying is, is for any x give me an x and I'll give you four of those x's back. But it doesn't matter what the x is, that could be its own list. It could be a number, it could be a sequence of numbers, it could be a sequence of a sequence of numbers. So there's some interesting sort of polymorphism going on here. Um, and again, yes, yeah, sequ sequences are the most fundamental, so we have lots of tools for, for manipulating this. So one of them that's very interesting is split and join, which you run into very frequently. So split takes any arbitrary sized integer and it splits it according to the type you give. So here I have said split this integer into four 8-bit integers, presumably this 32 bits to begin with. And if you do that, then you get this. And if I wanted to, I could have said two and 16, or you know, I could have just said, you know, um, you could have split it down to individual bits. You could have said 32 and one, for example. Um, and then in the opposite way, you can join them, right? So if I have any four, if I join them together in a sequence, I get you know, the concatenation of all of them. And the types are interesting here. So split has a set of parts, each and an A. A is the elements in the sequence, and each is how many elements are you know, pulled out, and then parts is how many of them you originally had. So, but if you read the type, it's pretty obvious, right? Like, you know, each must be finite. We must be dealing with a finite sequence, but given a sequence of A's of parts times each, just split that into a sequence with parts in each, right? So split actually, you know, is pretty interesting. And join works the same way, right? It's really just these two things flipped. If you have a sequence 
of a sequence, right, then you just multiply the sizes of the two together and you would get this. So there's a lot of flexibility in the way that you can sort of pull bits together, pull bits apart and put them back together again. And you know, like in Haskell, you know, here's a, another simpler example. You know, you can do pattern matching on this too. So if you want to flip them, right, uh, it takes any uh, any sequence of bits that is dividable by two, right, as a multiple of two, and then it returns two and it splits it in half, right? So there's lots of interesting sort of polymorphism going on here that you don't really get in a, in a lot of other languages. Um, and a lot of, it makes a lot of code write itself. Um, another example is that because, you know, like we said, we can have like 17, 18-bit integers, you know, numbers themselves are a sequence. So if I have a 31-bit integer, and uh, this is not, so it sets all the bits to one, I can just append a true onto it, right? And that true is a one bit, and that extends it to 32 bits. And also, because numbers themselves are sequences, right? This is a sequence, a bit vector of 32 bits. I can also use operations just on numbers themselves. So reverse will reverse a sequence, but a number is a sequence of bits. So I can take 0B, 1111000, and I can flip it easily. That could be a sequence, that could be an individual number, a sequence of sequences, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, interestingly, you can also throw constraints in. So here's a little bit more complicated one. H is a function that, given an x, x must be finite. It must be greater than equal, uh, or equal to 32, and yet 64 must be greater than or equal to x. And finally, the last constraint is the more, most interesting one, I think x mod 32 must equal 0. And if you think about this for a minute, what it's saying is, is that h will take, and here it's just you know, some kind of const function, just throws away the second argument. But interestingly, that means that h can only be given a sequence of, or it can only be given a 32 or 64-bit number, right? You can't give it, um, you can't do anything else. You can't give it a 16-bit, you can't give it a 48-bit, you can't give it a 96-bit, 128-bit. Um, depending because of the modulo here, right? This constraint has to be satisfied and the type checker checks it. So if you give it 17 bits, it will tell you something like 17 mod 32 equals zero cannot be resolved. And then interestingly, unlike other languages like Haskell too, you can actually saturate these variables. So X, you know, sort of is brought into scope as a type variable, but I can actually set X explicitly. So here I've got J, right, of X and Y, and it takes 64 bit ints. And I have used uh, backspace and you can remember what I call open stash, open mustache. Uh, and then you have x equals 64, right? And you can simplify that. You can, you know, um, a to reduce the parameters and you get h tilde x equals 64. And if you don't, if the positioning is, uh, is irrelevant, like if you do it in order that the type variables appear, variables appear, then you can just shorten that out to where you don't even have to mention the x, right? So that's really powerful because what that means is that I can write an algorithm like this that is specified to work over whatever this does. It works over 32 and 64-bit numbers only, but then I can always specialize it to any particular individual case, which is very powerful. Um, and you don't really have to write much more code to do that. So we should talk about an actual cryptographic function. Um, has anyone here actually heard of ChaCha20 or used it? Or ever read about it? Okay. A handful of people. So it is a symmetric 256-bit stream cipher written by a, or designed and implemented by a man named Dan Bernstein, who has a very large fan club. Um, you give ChaCha20 a key and a number, a unique number that you only use once, called a nonce, and it gives you back a high-quality chunk of random data. You can use that to encrypt data, and there's a little wrapper around it that will, you know, you give it a packet of data to and it'll encrypt it. Um, it's very attractive for a lot of reasons. It's very easy to implement, it's extremely secure, and it's very, very, very fast. You don't have to bribe Intel to use up, you know, part of their silicon for it. Um, even in software, it can compete with, like, a hardware AES implementation. It's very fast. Um, and it sort of, by design, it avoids some pitfalls in AES, too. And it's now an internet standard, and everyone loves standards. So um, it's actually quite a readable, well-written RFC, actually. So. ChaCha has a very important internal function called the quarter round, right? And a quarter round takes four 32-bit inputs and it gives you four 32-bit outputs. So here's some pseudocode from that RFC that, of what it looks like, right? And this is, you know, pseudo C, so sequencing happens from left to right, top to bottom. So 
And, and you'll note, if you just kind of look at it, it, it's pretty obvious, and there's a reason I formatted it this way. It's because, you know, there's like a, you know, there's a regularity here in, in the way the, um, the, the binders appear. So db, 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 uh, you know, dzor a, bzor d, dzor a, bzor d, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's just an easy way to lay it out so you see the commonalities. It does not look so nice in actual C. So I promise I'm not just throwing you through a loop. This is not contorted for no reason. There's a very specific reason I wrote it this way, but it doesn't look very nice. So in C, you can't really return multiple values, right? So you have to like have some kind of out pointer to a structure or something you would return. So that's kind of what we're doing here. What I'm saying is, is that it takes an A, B, C, and D, but these are really indexes into this array representing that number, right? So squint a little bit, and you can kind of see the code from the last place, right? A in this array X equals A plus B. D in this array equals Ds or A. And then you left rotate that by 16, right? Um, and I, like I said, you know, you might be wondering, like, why didn't I just pass pointers in? There's a reason for this in particular because of the way I actually designed the rest of the, or I implemented the rest of the, the, uh, the stream cipher. Um, but this isn't just, you know, it isn't arbitrary. In fact, most of the implementations follow a implementation that looks very close to this. So, but, you know, it, it just doesn't look good. And, and, you know, it's like all condensed and everything. And um, Encrypt all looks a little bit nicer. Barely managed to fit on this slide. Um, and it, you know, it, pretty much what you'd expect in, uh, in a functional language, right? You have four inputs. You give back four outputs. And uh, unfortunately, it's really long here. Fun fact, um, Cryptol, the or original version of Cryptol that was not publicly available, um, it actually had like multi-line, like multiple statements on one line, and the second version doesn't have that, and that actually really disappoints me. There's no way to do that. So unfortunately, you have to split it out individually into each line. But with the comments, you can see that it's pretty close, right? Medillo, the sort of naming with the uh, numbers on the end. But it, it, I mean, it looks nice, right? It looks okay. But, like, so this talk isn't just about writing crypto in a language where you run it in a repo and then, you know, don't do anything with it, right? So what about verifying our programs? Is there any way we could verify that this function and this function are the same, right? And I don't want, and I mean, there obviously are ways, but what I want is that I want a fairly easy, fairly automated, and fairly scalable way. So is there a way to do that? The answer might surprise you. So... Cryptol has a, to a sister tool that's called SAW, which stands for the Software Analysis Workbench. And it can do this using some very deep black magic that I will only lightly touch on later. But SAW has its own language. It has a language called SAWScript, and it's used for scripting proofs. SAWScript is built on Cryptol, and so you can actually embed Cryptol into it. But it's, it's not really a Cryptol language, it's a scripting language. You'll see what I mean. So we're just going to go ahead and start off, right? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, an important thing to know about SAW so it does not work on surface level syntax, right? That would be ridiculous in all honesty. Um, so what it does is it uses the intermediate representation from your compiler. So the current version comes with LVM bitcode, JVM bytecode, and Cryptol programs. In the past, Cryptol actually had a tool that would ingest a netlist, like from an FPGA tool. So you could actually verify that a C function is equivalent to a circuit, for example. But it doesn't have that anymore. So one thing we're going to do real quick, though, is I want this, I want to write a wrapper to make it behave a little bit better. Um, so before, right, those A's were, these numbers were indexes into that array. What I'm going to do here is, I'm going to say, if you give me that array and then give me some numbers, I will initialize this array with those numbers, and then I'll run the quarter round, right? And the difference here is before, if you remember, if you look back at that other function, right, these are indexes into the array, right? They are not the actual values themselves. I want to pass in the values to the function. I don't want to pass in indexes into an array and have to initialize the array, right? So this wrapper is just a very convenient way of doing it in C, right? This is saying that A is at the uh, zeroth index, you know, B is at the first index, C is at the second one, and D is at the third one, right? And then you say, at these indexes in this array, you know, do your diffusion. So now we can just compile that. So I highlighted the version here, because if you want to follow along, you will need this very specific version of Cryptol or, it will, or Clang, or it will not work, and then you will tweet angry things at me about how I'm terrible and I don't have anything you can reproduce. So if you want to try this, use, Clang, or use LVM 3.5. 
Uh, and then just, you know, emit LLVM bitcode, right? So don't actually compile an executable and don't give me an object, give me bitcode. And then we have three files here. We have the C file, the bitcode, and the crypto. And the crypto. So now we're going to write some saw script, right? And un unfortunately, sort of this example uh, is not too complicated, but it has to use sort of the most in-depth interface. But I think it, it'll be instructive to, to see sort of the long version. So the first thing we do is we need to actually load that module, right, and get like a, a value back that we can actually manipulate. Um, and if you actually drop into the shell, all these are functions that are typed. You can ask for the type at the REPL. You can, you know, investigate them. You can, you know, it has inference and everything. It's just a scripting language more than like a programming one. Now, one thing we have to do is that there are five inputs into our function, right? So what we need to do is we need to make up some variables first so we can actually um, prove them the same. So what we're going to do is, is we're going to construct a few symbolic variables just out of nowhere, and they're going to represent all the parameters. It's an interesting kind of syntax here. The first thing to note is that fresh symbolic actually takes two parameters. It takes a string that represents the name of the identifier in the source code, and then it takes a type, right? And this weird syntax is because earlier I mentioned that you can embed cryptol inside saw. That's a quasi quote. That's what it's doing. There's no way to write a type in saw itself, so you have to just embed a quasi quote with the cryptol type instead. Um, so here, x is four 32 bit integers, and then a, b, and c or d are just 32 bit integers by themselves. Right? And again, that name is important. That ties it to what it sees in the actual intermediate representation, because it's in there. And C is unfortunately a little bit just it's low level, you know, it's boring. And so one of the things we have to do whenever we're using the tools, we have to represent the inputs to our program, how they might be represented in memory. So let's think about that. If I had a function that needed an array of four 32-bit integers, right, and then four 32-bit integers, well, I obviously have to allocate the array first, right? So that's what the first thing is saying. We're saying any allocations that are needed to be performed in order for this function to be called, one of them is that the variable x needs to have four entries allocated into it. And it will figure this out in a second. It'll figure out the rest in a second. But then we need to actually state what the initial parameters are. Right? And you'll note I'm using star now, right? Instead of x, I'm using star x. So uh, th you think of it kind of like C syntax. Right here it's saying x is allocated of four, you know, 32-bit integers or whatever. But here, whatever x points to is tied to the symbolic variable x, right? So what this is doing is it's tying the identifier in the source code to the actual, the actual symbolic variable we constructed. And we're doing the same thing here, right? So the a variable is tied to the, or the a variable is tied to the a symbolic value, the b one is tied to the b symbolic value, c one to c, and d to d. And this is also the one of the other reasons you need to do it this way is because like I said earlier, there's no multiple return values. So whenever you have things like you need to write to an array and then that's the result, what we're saying here is the result of this function is actually the four bytes inside X whenever it's done, right? And the nice thing about doing this, which you'll see in a second, is Cryptol just magically wraps it all up into something that looks like a, a normal function. So now we need to symbolically execute it. And then we do this abstract symbolicate thing. It's a bit boring details. But basically, you can think of it as um, LLVM sim execute builds a model of your program. And then abstract symbolic sort of wraps it with some parameters so it can look like an actual cryptol function. But fundamentally, I mean, that's pretty boring. Um, really, all it's saying is, is that wrap f represents the model of this function. And finally, we have to do one more wrapper because those types aren't exactly the same, right? Because remember, q round takes a sequence of four, but this wrapping function, right, is just going to take individual parameters, right? So what I'm doing here is I'm using a quasi quote again for a function. So these two functions both accept four arguments in the exact same positions, only this one calls the cryptol q round function, and this one calls the model that we generated from the bit code from our actual C program. And uh, then what we do is, is we do some magic. We do something called converting these to AND inverter graphs, which I'll talk about in a minute. And then we do something called a combinatorial equivalence check. And it looks pretty much like this. And 
to be truthfully fair, I have no idea how you choose such terrible names for these functions, because BitBlast, like, I mean, come on. And then CEC is just the name of this one, like, really? Um, I mean, it's just, like, I mean, I was just kind of amazed whenever I initially wrote it. And, you know, the equivalence check one is especially weird, because I thought that was something really big. It's actually a reference to circuitry, right? So you can have combinatorial circuits, which don't have latches or state or anything. They're like pure functions just in hardware. So... Really, all this is saying is that a combinatorial equivalence check is just an equivalence check pretty much between two pure functions. Um, and then does that work? Yes, it does. And it can prove it in less than a tenth of a second, which obviously isn't very fast, like in this particular case. Um, but it actually works, right? And does it scale, right? So it does, actually. Um, and I do have a full proof of ChaCha20. Which I will show you now because it's demo time. Okay, so... Okay, yes. Oh, no. This is bad. Um, I have a small screen, so sorry for the small font. Uh, let me do GNOME Terminal. Uh, oh. There we go. I call it the Cryptonomicon because I th couldn't think of a better pun. I know, it's so lame. Um... Yes, okay. So the first thing we'll do is, I'm not going to spend too much time on this because I don't want to drop off too far into the weeds, but uh, first thing I'll do is I'll actually prove it. So I have a little tool here. And uh, this is going to take a minute, so we'll, we'll get back to it, right? It's sort of performing the equivalence test. And then in the meantime, I want to go and actually look at the code. So I'm not going to get too far into the weeds, but I do want to show you, you know, a little bit of where the functional aspect of it shines. I'm not really going to talk all about the design of uh, Cha Cha, but oh no, is that acceptably acceptably large? No. <laughs> wow. Thank you for being so frank. Um, shit. All right, I'm way off in the weeds now. I don't know how. I'm, I think I'm going to be lost. Oh wait, I have a better idea. <laughs> there we go. Okay. As a programmer, it's all about finding workarounds. Um, so we have that quarter round function, right? Well, there's another function that uses the quarter round that's pretty important. It's called the core function. And uh, we're going to look at that for a sec. It's pretty simple, right? Just think at a high level, just kind of squint. We have 64 bytes of output and 16 32-bit integers that are coming in. Right? So the first thing we do is we copy all the inputs. Right? We copy that into a temporary X. And then the spec says that you run 20 iterations of Q round in an alternating order. Another way of saying that is that you run Q round 10 times, just both ways once. And there's two rounds here. There's called the column round and the diagonal round. Let me readjust that so you can see a little bit better. Um, so, you know, we have the Q round, which, and by columns, you know, columns 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. And the diagonal round's a little bit weirder. It's 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, right? So when you look at that little matrix there, right, and that's actually the reason I wrote this. Remember how I said I didn't just arbitrarily add that X? This is the reason I added that X, because it makes it fall out very elegantly and look like this. So we do 10 iterations. We do the column round, the diagonal round. And overall, we do each of those 20 times, alternating. And finally, we take that initial, remember how we, uh, you know, we made that copy? So we could do this. What we're going to do is we're going to add that x back to the input. So for every 16-bit integer, right, xi equals xi plus ni. So we've done our rounds, and we've added them together. And then finally, we just need to, you know, like I said, the output is, uh, you know, uh, where was it? Uh, 64, you know, byte integers. Oh, no. There we go. Um, so there's just a little utility function I wrote here. For every 16-byte integer, it stores that inside the output variable, in the output buffer, right? But, I mean, this seems like, when I first wrote this, I was like, well, this seems pretty you know, intro functional programming-ish, right? Like if I had a function just to do these rounds, right? 
then I mean, isn't it just an iterate on some initial state value, right? And then I can index a sequence in a specific spot, right? As a Haskell programmer, I think about this often. You know, I generate all my results, and then I just index into the one I want. So it actually looks pretty nice in crypto when you look at this. Um, oh, that's the wrong one. So we have the column round, right? Like I said, I split this up into one function, right? So it runs one iteration of the column round and one of the diagonal round. And this is an interesting, I really liked this sort of slicing trick, right? And it gives it also an elegant look in the cryptal version. So it takes 16 32-bit integers and gives back 16, right? And then think about, right, we're pattern matching here on the sequences. So think about the way that we're sort of slicing things together, right? The Q round of x0, 4, x8, and x12, well, the output of that, the four result, would obviously be the Ys for those specific entries, right? If you think of sort of the you know, input buffer as like, a, as, you know, like a, a matrix, right? Doing the inputs, or doing this function, this quarter round over these four points, obviously gives back a transformed version of those points, right? So, X, so I have all my Xs, right? And I map them to Ys, and that's the column round. And then I take all my Ys again, and I map them to Zs, and that's the diagonal round, right? And again, look, like, again, you'll notice the column 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. So they all match up. And now I need to actually implement the core function, which is like two lines, right? So all I'm going to do is, if you give me a round I need to operate over, I'm just going to do an infinite amount of iterations. Iterate is lazy. It will generate an infinite sequence of the application of that function over and over and over again. And then the result is just the 10th entry, right? And this blocked function, all it does is it converts those, 32, six, those 16 32 byte bytes into 64 bit, uh, or I'm sorry, the 16 32 bit integers into the 64 output, output bytes. And again, note, I added x to the result, right? So that's like very, very elegant. It was a very, when I first wrote that, I was very impressed with how nicely that just sort of rolled out off my keyboard. Um, oh, yes, and here we are. So. We extracted the function, right? We produced and inverter graphs, and then we checked if they're equivalent. And that all happened, I seem to remember it taking like a minute before, so I don't know why it's only 14 seconds, but apparently it's okay. So I really don't care. It says it was okay. And actually, uh, let's see here. Um, so if I were to... Oh, I don't know. Switching between Vim and Emacs, I'm such a heretic. Um, right, and that will fail eventually. I'll leave that burning my CPU cycles while it's happening. Um, so, you know, you've seen sort of the verification toolkit, right? Um, and it works pretty well. And the interesting thing is, is, you know, the thing we wrote for the quarter round, the actual script for the actual proof of the real thing is, I don't know, maybe like a little bit longer. Like, ah, see, invalid. Um, I think if we look at the actual script, it's like only slightly longer. Right, so we had that Q round script. All I really do is I have a slightly different wrapper and I just sort of fiddle with the names. You can basically just copy and paste this proof script and just like sort of twiddle with it, and I mean, you'll get something that'll work for you. Um, it's the lowest level interface, so you have a lot of control. Um, so yeah, I mean, it looks pretty much the exact same for the full actual verification of, of the cipher versus just one particular function, which is great because it means that it's so easy to just have this proof that can just be lightly tweaked to modify, what, uh, to accommodate your needs. Um, but now I want to talk about how that actually works a little bit. I'm going to be very extremely hand wavy. Um, so, in, in the world today, you know, we have a lot of NP problems, right? So there's traveling salesmen, bin packing, subgraph isomorphism, Boolean, SAT. Uh, I'm sure people in this room have written papers about it. Um, you know, I mean, it, I'm pretty sure most people here are familiar with these kinds of problems. But one of the nice things is uh, any, every one of these problems, oh, I meant to rewrite this paragraph, um, are NP complete problems, right? And we can translate between them. 
So if you have traveling salesmen, you can convert that into SAT, and you can throw that into a SAT solver and see if you can find a solution. Very nice. It means that we can take, in this particular case, for example, it means that any sort of nice tricks we have for SAT solving, right, we can apply to traveling salesmen very nicely. It allows you to leverage domain knowledge somewhere else. It's nice. Uh, and circuits. So circuits are a fundamental component of sort of, well, everything that's making this presentation happen in all your computers. So we spend a lot of time making sure circuits are correct, right? Allegedly. Um, if you look at Intel errata, you know, allegedly. Um, and for hardware engineers, you know, you really want faster and smaller circuits, right? It's always nice to, to save, right? To save gates, to save silicon space. And yet it needs to retain the exact same functionality in all cases, right? And even if you were only to do something like, say, a couple percent reduction in the amount of gates you had, that could be really, really, you know, that could result in a completely different looking circuit. So, you know, you need to do all sorts, you need to have, you know, for people who do this, they have test benches and all sorts of synthesizer tools and, you know, analysis tools and stuff like that. Um, but fundamentally, if you're optimizing a circuit, you need an equivalence check, right? And so, for me, whenever I think of circuits, I think of optimization as requiring equivalence check for a validity. And verification is really just equivalence checking against an original version, right? Like when you optimize something, you check it against the previous version, maybe it got 2% faster. But when you verify it, you, you check it against the most obviously correct thing, right? And uh, just a side note, you know, SAT and digital circuits are pretty closely related in a lot of ways. Obviously, aside from being NP complete, there's circuit SAT um, and sort of all sorts of interesting things happening in that, that happen in that space. Um, and now we have to go to ABC. So how does this all tie together? Um, ABC is a tool from Berkeley that is designed for the synthesis and verification of logical circuits. So you build circuits with it, and then you can verify that they're equivalent. Um, and the secret here is the internal representation it uses, which, as I mentioned earlier, is called an AND and Verter graph. And an AND and Verter graph represents a circuit using only AND and NOT. Some of you may know NAND is universal, so this kind of makes sense, right? And SAT normally uses AND OR, so that's conjunctive normal form, or CNF. Uh, so there's a couple properties of this form that are pretty interesting. Um, it's easy to translate back to SAT, but more importantly, for the purposes of Cryptol, it has an optimization in ABC called fragging. And uh, it is an optimization where given two circuits, it will essentially try to find all of the equivalent parts of them, and it will merge them together, and then it will share them. And there's a, there's a picture out there that explains this, and it's the only picture anyone uses, and I unfortunately think it's terrible. But if you just think of two circles overlapping, right, like as they begin to overlap, like all that shared space, the intersection, is all of the parts of the circuits that have been merged and shared. And if your circuits are the same, eventually those two circles will completely overlap. Right? And if they're not, then you will stall out trying to do that. Um, not a very good visual representation, unfortunately. Um, and, you know, and invertigraphs, I was reading about them, you know, they have lots of other interesting properties. There are cases where you can have a, uh, you can have terms that are sort of exponential in CNF or DNF, but they are linear in and invertigraph form. So it's actually a very scalable representation for actually uh, doing things like verifying, for working with Boolean functions, right? And that's what you're doing in SAT, because or in here, because what you're doing is you're saying, are these two circuits equivalent? That's an output of one bit, true or false, right? So they're very useful here. They're very scalable for sorts of program analysis. Um, and underneath, after ABC frags your graph, it will use a SAT, it will translate it back to SAT, and it will just ask the SAT solver to solve it for you. So at the very end of the day, I think it uses PicoSAT or Crypto MiniSAT or something like that. Um, and so pretty much once you, hand, once you build the actual graph and you hand it off to ABC, it'll mostly do the rest for you. So that's sort of, you know, background on, you know, how the sort of verification tech works. I highly encourage you, you know, to sort of, if you just Google and in graphs, you will find tons of great material, actually, about all sorts of interesting hardware and program analysis and logical things. Um, so I recommend, you know, just maybe, you know, if you're interested, looking a bunch of this stuff up. All right, so I'm going to change gears a little bit again. Now that we've talked about how the tool chain kind of works. Um, here's a fun bug. I don't know if any of you maybe remember this. Uh, so there's a bug in Android 4.3, basically 2013, like a million years ago. And this bug significantly reduced the amount of entropy given by the system RNG. So it was initially supposed to be 160 bits, and it actually gave you 64 bits of entropy, which is not good. Uh, this was tied to some Bitcoin theft. So I don't know if any of you were involved in that, but if you are, I'm sorry. Uh, 
And so, but there's an interesting way to phrase this problem, right? Which is the, the property you want from the RNG essentially is that it's injective, right? So, what it, so if, for some of you may not remember, right, for an injective function, if you have the domain and the codomain, right, injectivity is when a func no function ever maps, two functions ever map to the same output, right? You never want to have two inputs to this number generator and have them both give you the same output ever. So, we can phrase this essentially as a SAT problem, right? Are there any values, x1 and x2, such that x1 and x2 are not equal, yet f of x1 equals f of x2, right? Can you find something that satisfies this, any x1 and x2, right? And then you need to also, you need to talk about the inverse too. So the inverse here is either x1 and x2 are the same, in which case that's, you know, all gravy, or they cannot be equivalent, right? The, or f of x cannot be equal to uh, f of x2, right? So these are, these are sort of two different sides of the same coin. One is saying that, you know, I want to find any examples where this doesn't hold, and the other one is saying I want to prove that this is the case, right? Slightly different. And you can actually do this. This is actually working on the actual source code from the Android AOSP. Um, and with the code I have, there's some class files because compiling it is a bit of a chore. Um, but here's what we're going to do. So with SawScript, one thing you can do very nice is you can just read an arbitrary and inverter graph from a file. So I compiled those Jellybean and KitKat, uh, the two versions of Android's RNG, into graphs. And then pretty much going to do exactly what I just said. Right? Can I find any case for the Jellybean RNG where x1 and x2 aren't equal, but the outputs are right, of the function? And furthermore, right, this is trying to find a specific case. Right? This is trying to find a satisfiable case. One individual case is all we need. This is a proof, actually. Right? Note that. This is actually, here I'm actually proving that the new version will never, on any pass, ever give out the same answer for two different inputs. And believe it or not, it can totally do that in less than a second. So, and it gives you a nice, you know, satisfying clause, which I, you know, found rather humorous that it immediately tries zero and then some, you know, gigantic, unbelievable number. Uh, but, uh, you know, just sort of weird. I would have expected it to be two arbitrary things, but I guess, you know, it just hones in on stuff like that. Um, and, you know, it's interesting, too, because proving injectivity on the fixed version is actually faster. And the person who did this, this is an example from someone at Galwan named Aaron Toom, he noted that, there was recently last year a paper about proving this, like mechanically, and they had to use sort of control flow information tools with annotations, and they had to like write out like a 95 step like manual proof or something like that. Um, this is like 20 minutes of work, so it's a pretty nice trade off. Um, right, and so, so move a little bit forward too, and change gears a little bit again. We can also talk about hash functions, right? Interest, another interesting example I got from Aaron. Uh, so hash functions are really common and you've probably used them. I mean, even if you may have not used a lot of cryptographic software when you write software, you've probably used a hash function somewhere, right? Um, and broadly, sort of, there's a broad category of different hashes, but common ones are a form called Merkle Domgard. And there are some variants, like Blake. Uh, but they all roughly sort of follow this basic scheme, right? So you take the input, and you split it into equally sized blocks. There may be some padding involved in doing this. Um, for example, I believe Blake 256 will pad it into 512-bit blocks for the input, um, which is a bit weird rather than specifying it in bytes, I always thought. Uh, and then after you split all the blocks, you will compress them into an output. So compression consists internally of a set of rounds that are run over the input block. The, in, the very first input block has an initial vector for the, that it takes as input, right? And whenever you compress block in, the result of that compression is fed, is seeded through to the next block, right? Um, and the result of compressing the final block is the actual hash. So, for example, if you broke it up into three blocks, right, you would have the initial vector, right? You compress the first block, it gives you an output. Then you compress the second block and you use the output of the first block and you feed it in as an input, um, and so on and so on and so on, until you finally get the resulting hash. But the important thing to note is that there are multiple rounds happening per compression. So 
Hashes are really difficult to find collisions for directly because you often have high levels of rounds. But a really useful metric whenever people analyze the security of hashes are is looking at the security margin based on a reduced round, right? Like how easy it is to attack a reduced amount of rounds up to a point. And uh, so we proved injectivity for an RNG. And I mean, it's, this is really just sort of a stone throw away in terms of a you know, logical statement of uh, can we you know, match this or, what, or whatnot. Um, and yeah, we can actually. So Aaron actually wrote the SHA-1 and SHA-256. I actually wrote the Blake-256, which he used an example. So I'm now using his example again uh, in return. So SHA-1 has 80 rounds, right, total. And Cryptol is able to find a collision even up to 21 rounds in 40 seconds. So that brings its security margin down to 74%, right? 21 out of 80 rounds are down. SHA-256 has 64 rounds, and it was able to find a collision up to 16 in only a second and a half, which is pretty interesting, I thought. So the security margin is just barely better. But Blake does amazing. It only has 14 rounds, yet it was only able to barely find a collision on round one in 23 seconds, right? So it has a margin of 93%, which is very good. Right, so, you know, it, it, interesting, you know, you, you can't really do things like find collisions directly, but you can get a kind of an idea of, you know, how far off these sort of things are. And I mean, for reference, like, SHA-1 will probably be broken in a couple years. Do you have a question? Yeah, what is meant by the security margin? Uh, it is essentially just, you know, if we, if, uh, 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 if you have 80 total rounds, right, and you could never find a collision in any round, even the, the most basic one, right, then you have a security margin of 100%. It's just, a way, it's just a ratio of how many rounds can you go before you stop finding collisions, right? So I can go from one round, I can change my SHA function to go from one round all the way up to 21 rounds, and I will still be able to find collisions. From 22 up to 80 rounds, I can't find any more. For this, from round 17 up to round 64, I can find no collisions. Right? And Blake, like I said, does really good. It has 14 rounds, but I cannot find any collisions past the first one. And again, it took 23 seconds here. So you know, keep that in mind. Right? That went 20 rounds in at 40 seconds. This took 23 seconds for one round. Right? So you can kind of get an idea sort of, of the security levels of each of them. And like I said, SHA-1 will probably be broken um, quite soon. Um, as in like easily, probably less than the next, like, I don't know, four or five years probably. Um, and so this is all kind of nice, but whenever I was playing with this toolkit, I sort of hit like a random problem and it really began making me think. So sort of to wrap up, I'll just sort of noodle a little bit mostly. Um, you know, one thing I thought was, well, I, uh, you know, I, my compiler will optimize my, my C code, right? So clearly I should just optimize the, uh, you know, get optimized R and I should check that, right? then I know that the compiler, even its optimizations, preserved all the semantics I want. Um, so that works. That doesn't. You just add O2 because it doesn't support the instruction that the actual optimizer will bring in. O1 actually does work in this example. Um, but there are also some other weird cases. I don't exactly know how well it handles when undefines are introduced directly into the IR, which can happen. Um, and fundamentally, you know, I was thinking about this and I was like, well, I could probably find like a set of options or optimizations that would result in something that's far more optimized, yet I can still do a check on it. But, you know, it's just, you know, we're operating at the IR level, right? And the IR level is not really represent representative of what will go on at the lowest levels. So if you can't check the IR when it's optimized, when you do things like vectorize, right? Vectorization is incredibly important for cryptography. If you can't verify that, I mean, you take a real risk that the compiler will screw something up, right? LLVM and Clang is, clo is closing in on a million lines of code, right? It is a very large, what you would call TCB, a trusted computing base, right? You're relying a lot on that optimizer to work correctly. Um, and working on a compiler for a day job, I am honestly amazed my computer boots most days um, and or doesn't just catch into flames randomly I mean it's pretty old it's getting there um, but you know it you know I was really upset with this right I was really 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 upset with this and I began noodling about it and thinking you know it's like I don't want to trust this right so maybe I could 
Maybe there should be something a little bit lower level than C, right? I don't think C actually matches the abstraction level we need for things like this. And I think we should just give up on C for writing things like this, in all honesty. Um, but I'm not really sure what to go to. Because I was thinking about it more, and I was like, OK. So I could have something just barely above assembly language. But that doesn't work. Not in all cases. Here's a pop quiz for any assembly nerds in the audience. This is an x86 instruction that will shift a register by 32 bits to the left. That is the arm variant right there. Given the registers have one in them, are those two instructions equivalent? Will they result in the same output on their respective processors? Can anyone answer that? That is true, but actually for ARM mnemonics, just for x86, that equals one. And for ARM, it's just undefined. <laughs> so the, I mean, the CPU can just, you know, it'll just give you zero normally. Like actually, if you, if you shift it that way, because you're not normally going to shift that way, you're going to mask it in or something, right, when you're in like supervised mode. So you're right. But this particular instruction, um, you know, we can't even agree on what happens when you shift a 32-bit integer by 32 bits. Right? So what hope do we have to have like a assembly language level thing, right? I almost feel like what we really need is sort of a family of functions, one sort of for each major processor. And what you would really have is something just kind of barely above assembly, maybe a DSL, and you just basically put a register allocator on it. You know, just slap a register allocator in there. Um, unsurprisingly, Dan Bernstein had this idea about 10 years ago. His implementation is horrible. I'm not even going to mention it. Um, it is unbelievably undocumented, and the source code is... I can't even describe it with words. Um, and, you know, but, but something like this I think would be a lot more profitable. I think something like Haskell would be, or even OCaml or F Sharp would be a very good host language for this. Because, you know, at low levels, you still have, right, patterns that you can abstract out, but in assembly language, you can't do that, right? I sort of imagine like if I had a DSL to write assembly in Haskell, right? I can do all kinds of things like I can, you know, I can add loops, I can add control flow, right? I can add sort of macros to my assembler, right? And I think we need a tool like that. Because C is a language that just, it's just terrible. Like it just, especially compilers and programmers operate, like from what I say here, this is the way I refer to it, it's, they're on the same page but in completely different books, you know what I mean? So you're just talking right past one another, you know? Um, and sort of the semantics that we have for C don't really match what we want. Like, C makes all sorts of weird assumptions about signed overflow and all kinds of things that lead to just really weird counterintuitive results. And this is the kind of stuff where actually writing it in assembly by hand may be worth it. Because you may be able to pull off 20% extra performance. And if you're working at line rate at gigabit, right, you need to be able to process bytes as fast as possible. I'm talking, I have my implementation of ChaCha20 uh, can process, I think, naively with no optimization. It can do one byte per every five cycles. An optimized version is going to do about a byte, about 1.9 cycles. So there's about, a fact, there's about a factor of five performance in the table right there. And it's very significant whenever you begin to talk about, can I saturate my 10 gigabit NIC? Um, so I don't really think that C is a very good language for this stuff. And unfortunately, it's kind of the best we have right now. Um, I would really like to see a tool like this that built on something like Cryptol, right? I want it to, I want it to take my sort of, you know, intermediate representation, feed it back in, and then I want to be able to prove that equivalent to C, right? Rather than trying to show that the stack, you know, it's turtles all the way down and the turtles aren't crazy, right? You just want to have be at the top, be at the bottom, and you want to make sure those are the same, right? You just want to meet in the middle. You want to go all the way down. Um, but, you know, yeah, it's, it's a complicated, you know, very messy issue, um, and unfortunately, you know, there hasn't been a lot of, you know, good work, I think, in this area. So everyone just writes it in C, because there's C compilers everywhere, and C is terrible, but everyone can agree it's terrible, at least, I guess. So I suppose that's about it. I guess with the, I may have finished a little bit early. Um, no? Oh, okay, yeah. So, uh, yeah, so this is the end, so thank you. Uh, I have a Twitter that you can pester me. Um, if you're a cryptographer, an actual cryptographer, you're probably supremely disappointed, so you can send all your passionate complaints to me there. And if you want the software, go to cryptol.net and saw.galwa.com. And I'd like to thank a couple people, Ed Yang and Aaron Toom. From, uh, they both had a lot of good material about, AI, about ABC and uh, sort of 
interesting examples of using SAT for cryptography. Uh, Samantha, my coworkers, and my family I love for supporting me because I was very nervous about this talk. So I think that's it. All right, I think we'll have time for just one question. Uh-oh. Make it good. Sha3. Uh, actually, so there was a pretty interesting example. Um, that, that collision, that reduced round collision, I think actually one interesting thing I found was, so Blake was a Sha3 competitor, right? Um, I actually think that when Aaron ran sort of this stuff, he actually found, a, he actually took two rounds in Ketchak in order to find a collision, which I thought was interesting. Um, I haven't specified it. Um, I sort of focus on, uh, I've, you know, I guess, you know, I'm a Dan Bernstein fanboy. So, you know, and I like Blake a lot because especially it's very, very fast in software. And Ketchak, I think, is a good complement in hardware if you have support for it. So, um, and, you know, for me, it's incredibly important that software implementations are fast, right? Because, I mean, you know, <laughs> when you go to needing coprocessors, it becomes difficult, you know, money-wise. Um, and unfortunately, I don't think we're going to really see SHA-3 break in very far. The nice thing is that SHA-1 is going to die soon, but SHA-256 and, you know, the SHA-2 family is okay. And Rust? Uh, so there actually was someone, I believe, who did use Rust and actually did use Cryptol, or SAW, I'm sorry, for, um, for proving equivalence on the LVMIR it generated. So, um, Yes, you can absolutely use you know lang any kind of language that compiles to LVMIR. It, like I said, you know it doesn't support every instruction, every kind of thing like that. So you may have to twiddle with it, but you know you should be able to make it work. All right. Thanks, Austin. Awesome.